Chapter 16 of A Strange Manuscript Found in a Copper Cylinder This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Craig Whitehorn A Strange Manuscript Found in a Copper Cylinder by James DeMille Chapter 16 The Kosekin these people call themselves the Kosekin. Their chief characteristic, or at least their most prominent one, is their love of darkness, which perhaps is due to their habit of dwelling in caves. Another feeling equally strong and perhaps connected with this is their love of death and dislike of life. This is visible in many ways and affects all their character. It leads to a passionate self-denial, an incessant effort to benefit others at their own expense. Each one hates life and longs for death. He, therefore, hates riches and all things that are associated with life. Among the Kosekin, everyone makes perpetual efforts to serve others, which, however, are perpetually baffled by the unselfishness of these others. People thus spend years in trying to overreach one another, so as to make others richer than themselves. In a race, each one tries to keep behind, but as this leads to confusion, there is then a universal effort for each one to be first, so as to put his neighbor in the honorable position of the rear. It is the same way in a hunt. Each one presses forward, so as to honor his companion by leaving him behind. Instead of injuring, everyone tries to benefit his neighbor. When one has been benefited by another, he is filled with a passion which may be called Kosekin revenge, namely a sleepless and vehement desire to bestow some adequate and corresponding benefit on the other. Feuds are thus kept up among families and wars among nations, for no one is willing to accept from another any kindness, any gift, or any honor, and all are continually on the watch to prevent themselves from being overreached in this way. Those who are less watchful than others are overwhelmed with gifts by designing men who wish to attain to the pauper class. The position of Alma and myself illustrates this. Our ignorance of the blessings and honors of poverty led us to receive whatever was offered us. Taking advantage of our innocence and ignorance, the whole city thereupon proceeded to bestow their property upon us, and all became paupers through our fortunate arrival. No one ever injures another unless by accident, and when this occurs it affords the highest joy to the injured party. He has now a claim on the injurer. He gets him into his power, is able to confer benefits on him, and force upon him all that he wishes. The unhappy injurer, thus punished by the reception of wealth, finds himself helpless, and where the injury is great, the injured man may bestow upon the other all his wealth and attain to the envied condition of a pauper. Among the Kosekin, the sick are objects of the highest regard. All classes vie with one another in their attentions. The rich send their luxuries. The paupers, however, not having anything to give, go themselves and wait on them and nurse them. For this there is no help, and the rich grumble, but can do nothing. The sick are thus sought out incessantly, and most carefully tended. When they die, there is great rejoicing, since death is a blessing. But the nurses labor hard to preserve them in life so as to prolong the enjoyment of the high privilege of nursing. Of all sick, the incurable are most honored, since they require nursing always. Children also are highly honored and esteemed, and the age, too, since both classes require the care of others and must be the recipients of favors which all are anxious to bestow. Those who suffer from contagious diseases are more sought after than any other class, for in waiting on these there is the chance of gaining the blessing of death, Indeed, in these cases much trouble is usually experienced from the rush of those who insist on offering their services. For it must never be forgotten that the Kosekin love death as we love life, and this accounts for all those ceremonies which to me were so abhorrent, especially the scenes of the Mista Kosek. To them a dead human body is no more than the dead body of a bird. There is no awe felt, no sense of sanctity, of superstitious horror, and so I learned, with a shudder, that the hate of life is a far worse thing than the fear of death. This desire for death is, then, a master passion, and is the key to all their words and acts. They rejoice over the death of friends, since those friends have gained the greatest of blessings. They rejoice also at the birth of children, since those who are born will one day gain the bliss of death. 
For a couple to fall in love is the signal for mutual self-surrender. Each insists on giving up the loved one, and the more passionate the love is, the more eager is the desire to have the loved one married to someone else. Lovers have died broken-hearted from being compelled to marry one another. Poets here among the Kosekans celebrate unhappy love, which has met with this end. These poets also celebrate defeat instead of victories, since it is considered glorious for one nation to sacrifice itself to another. But to this there are important limitations, as we shall see. Poets also celebrate street sweepers, scavengers, lamplighters, laborers, and above all, paupers, and pass by as unworthy of notice the authors, Meleks, and Cohens of the land. The paupers here form the most honorable class. Next to these are the laborers. These have strikes with us, but it is always for harder work, longer hours, or smaller pay. The contest between capital and labor rages. But the conditions are reversed, for the grumbling capitalist complains that the laborer will not take as much pay as he ought to, while the laborer thinks the capitalist too persistent in his efforts to force money upon him. Here among the Kosekin, the wealthy class forms the mass of the people, while the aristocratic few consist of the paupers. These are greatly envied by the others, and have many advantages. The cares and burdens of wealth, as well as wealth itself, are here considered a curse and from all these the paupers are exempt. There is a perpetual effort on the part of the wealthy to induce the paupers to accept gifts, just as among us the poor try to rob the rich. Among the wealthy there is a great and incessant murmur at the obstinacy of the paupers. Secret movements are sometimes set on foot, which aim at the redistribution of property and a leveling of all classes, so as to reduce the haughty paupers to the same condition as the mass of the nation. More than once there has been a violent attempt at a revolution, so as to force wealth on the paupers, but as a general thing these movements have been put down and their leaders severely punished. The paupers have shown no mercy in their hour of triumph, they have not conceded one jot to the public demand, and the unhappy conspirators have been condemned to increase wealth and luxury, while the leaders have been made Meleks and Cohens. Thus there are among the Kosekin the unfortunate many who are cursed with wealth, and the fortunate few who are blessed with poverty. These walk while the others ride, and from their squalid huts look proudly and contemptuously upon the palaces of their unfortunate fellow countrymen. The love of death leads to perpetual efforts on the part of each to lay down his life for another. This is a grave difficulty in hunts and battles. Confined prisoners dare not fly, for in such an event the guards kill themselves. This leads to fresh rigors in the captivity of the prisoners in case of their recapture, for they are overwhelmed with fresh luxuries and increased splendors. Finally, if a prisoner persists and is recaptured, he is solemnly put to death, not, as with us, by way of severity, but as the last and greatest honor. Here extremes meet. The death, whether for honor or dishonor, is all the same. Death and is reserved for desperate cases. But among the Kosekin, this lofty destiny is somewhat embittered by the agonizing thought on the part of the prisoner, who thus gains it, that his wretched family must be doomed, not, as with us, to poverty and want, but, on the contrary, to boundless wealth and splendor. Among so strange a people, it seems singular to me what offenses could possibly be committed which could be regarded and punished as crimes. These, however, I soon found out. Instead of robbers, the Kosekin punish the secret bestowers of their wealth on others. This is regarded as a very grave offense. Analogous to our crime of piracy is the forcible arrest of ships at sea and the transfer to them of valuables. Sometimes the Kosekin pirates give themselves up as slaves. Kidnapping, assault, highway robbery, and crimes of violence have their parallel here in cases where a strong man, meeting a weaker, forces himself upon him as his slave or compels him to take his purse. If the weaker refuse, the assailant threatens to kill himself, which act would lay the other under obligations to receive punishment from the state in the shape of gifts and honors, or at least subject him to unpleasant inquiries. Murder has its counterpart among the Kosekin in cases where one man meets another, forces money on him, and kills himself. Forgery occurs where one uses another's name so as to confer money on him. There are many other crimes, all of which are severely punished. The worse the offense is, the better is the offender treated. 
Among the Kosekin, capital punishment is imprisonment amid the greatest splendor, where the prisoner is treated like a king and has many palaces and great retinues. For that which we consider the highest they regard as the lowest, and with them the chief post of honor is what we would call the lowest menial office. Of course, among such a people, any suffering from want is unknown, except when it is voluntary. The pauper class, with all their great privileges, have this restriction that they are forced to receive enough for food and clothing. Some, indeed, manage by living in out-of-the-way places to deprive themselves of these, and have been known to die of starvation, but this is regarded as dishonorable, as taking an undue advantage of a great position, and where it can be proved, the children and relatives of the offender are severely punished according to the Kosekin fashion. State politics here move, like individual affairs, upon the great principle of contempt for earthly things. The state is willing to destroy itself for the good of other states, but as other states are in the same position, nothing can result. In times of war, the object of each army is to honor the other and benefit it by giving it the glory of defeat. The contest is thus most fierce. The Kosekin, through their passionate love of death, are terrible in battle, and when they are also animated by the desire to confer glory on their enemies by defeating them, they generally succeed in their aim. This makes them almost always victorious, and when they are not so, not a soul returns alive. Their state of mind is peculiar. If they are defeated, they rejoice, since defeat is their chief glory. But if they are victorious, they rejoice still more in the benevolent thought that they have conferred upon the enemy the joy, the glory, and the honor of defeat. Here all shrink from governing others. The highest wish of each is to serve. The Meleks and Cohens, whom I at first considered the highest, are really the lowest orders. Next to these come the authors, then the merchants, then farmers, then artisans, then laborers, and finally the highest rank is reached in the paupers. Happy the aristocratic, the haughty, the envied paupers. The same thing is seen in their armies. The privates here are highest in rank, and the officers come next in different graduations. These officers, however, have the command and the charge of affairs as with us. Yet this is consistent with their position, for here to obey is considered nobler than to command. In the fleet the rowers are the highest class, next come the fighting men, and the lowest of all are the officers. War arises from motives as peculiar as those which give rise to private feuds, as, for instance, where one nation tries to force a province upon another, where they try to make each other greater, where they try to benefit unduly each other's commerce, where one may have a smaller fleet or army than has been agreed upon, or where an ambassador has been presented with gifts or received too great honor or attention. In such a country as this, where riches are disliked and despised, I could not imagine how people could be induced to engage in trade. This, however, was soon explained. The laborers and artisans have to perform their daily work so as to enable the community to live and move and have its being. Their impelling motive is the high one of benefiting others most directly. They refuse anything but the very smallest pay, and insist on giving for this the utmost possible labor. Tradesmen also have to supply the community with articles of all sorts. Merchants have to sail their ships to the same end, all being animated by the desire of affecting the good of others. Each one tries not to make money, but to lose it. But as the competition is sharp and universal, this is difficult, and the larger portion are unsuccessful. The purchasers are eager to pay as much as possible, and the merchants and traders grow rich in spite of their utmost endeavors. The wealthy classes go into business so as to lose money, but in this they seldom succeed. It has been calculated that only 2% in every community succeed in reaching the pauper class. The tendency is for all the labors of the working class to be ultimately turned upon the unfortunate wealthy class. The workmen, being the creators of wealth, and refusing to take adequate pay, cause a final accumulation of the wealth of the community in the hands of the mass of the non-producers, who thus are fixed in their unhappy position, and can hope for no escape except by death. The farmers till the ground, the fishermen fish, the laborers toil, and the wealth thus created is pushed from these incessantly till it all falls upon the lowest class, namely the rich, including Athons, Meleks, and Cohens. It is a burden that is often too heavy to be borne, but there is no help for it, 
and the better-minded seek to cultivate resignation. Women and men are in every respect absolutely equal, holding precisely the same offices and doing the same work. In general, however, it is observed that women are a little less fond of death than men, and a little less unwilling to receive gifts. For this reason they are very numerous among the wealthy class, and abound in the offices of administration. Women serve in the army and navy as well as men, and from their lack of ambition or energetic perseverance they are usually relegated to the lower ranks, such as officers and generals. To my mind it seemed as though the women were in all the offices of honor and dignity, but in reality it was the very opposite. The same is true in the family. The husbands insist on giving everything to the wives and doing everything for them. The wives are therefore universally the rulers of the household, while the husbands live in apparently subordinate, but to the Kosekin, a more honorable position. As to the religion of the Kosekin, I could make nothing of it. They believe that after death they go to what they call the world of darkness. The death they long for leads to the darkness that they love, and the death and the darkness are eternal. Still, they persist in saying that the death and the darkness together form a state of bliss. They are eloquent about the happiness that awaits them there in the sunless land, the world of darkness. But for my own part, it always seemed to me a state of nothingness. End of chapter 16 Recording by Craig Whitehorn, Atlanta, Georgia, April 8, 2008seventeen of a strange manuscript found in a copper cylinder this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by eddie winter a strange manuscript found in a copper cylinder by james de mille chapter seventeen belief and unbelief The doctor was here interrupted by Featherstone, who, with a yawn, informed him that it was eleven o'clock, and that human endurance had its limits. Upon this the doctor rolled up the manuscript and put it aside for the night, after which supper was ordered. Well, said Featherstone, what do you think of this last? It contains some very remarkable statements, said the doctor. There are certainly monsters enough in it, said Malek. Golgans and Hydras, and Chimera's Dyer. Well, why not, said the doctor. It seems to me, said Malek, that the writer of this has peopled his world with creatures that resemble the fossil animals more than anything else. The so-called fossil animals, said the doctor, may not be extinct. There are fossil specimens of animals that still have living representatives. There is no reason why many of those supposed to be extinct may not be alive now. It is well known that many very remarkable animals have become extinct within a comparatively recent period. These great birds, of which Moore speaks, seem to me to belong to these classes. The dodo was in existence fifty years ago, the moa about a hundred years ago. These great birds, together with others such as the Epionis and Palapteryx, have disappeared not through the ordinary course of nature, but by the hand of man. Even in our hemisphere they may yet be found. Who can tell but that the moa, or the dodo, may yet be lurking somewhere here in the interior of Madagascar, of Borneo, or of Papua? Can you make out anything about those great birds? asked Featherstone. Do they resemble anything that exists now, or has ever existed? Well, yes, I think so, said the doctor. Unfortunately, Moore is not at all close or accurate in his descriptions. He has a decidedly unscientific mind, and so one cannot feel sure. Yet from his general statements I think I can decide pretty nearly upon the nature and the scientific name of each one of his birds and animals. It is quite evident to me that most of these animals belong to races that no longer exist among us, and that this world at the South Pole has many characteristics which are like those of what is known as the Coal Period. I allude in particular to the vast forests of fern, of gigantic grasses and reeds. At the same time, the general climate and the atmosphere seem like what we may find in the tropics at present. It is evident in Moore's world 
the various epochs are represented, and that animals of different ages are living side by side. "'What do you think of the Yopcook? asked Featherstone with a yawn. "'Well, I hardly know.' "'Why, it must be a dodo, of course,' said Malik, only magnified. "'That,' said the doctor gravely, "'is a thought that naturally suggests itself. "'But then the Yopcook is certainly far larger than the dodo.' "'Oh!' Moore put on his magnifying glasses just then. The dodo, continued the doctor, taking no notice of this, in other respects corresponds with Moore's description of the opcook. Clusius and Bontius give good descriptions, and there is a well-known picture of one in the British Museum. It is a massive clumsy bird, ungraceful in its form, with heavy movements, wings too short for flight, little or no tail, and down rather than feathers. The body, according to Bontius, is as big as that of the African ostrich, but the legs are very short. It has a large head, great black eyes, long bluish-white bill, ending in a beak like that of a vulture, yellow legs, thick and short, four toes on each foot, solid, long, and armed with sharp black claws. The flesh, particularly on the breast, is fat and esculent. Now all this corresponds with Moore's account, except as to the size of the two, for the opcooks are as large as oxen. Oh, that's nothing, said Malek. I'm determined to stand up for the dodo. With this he burst forth singing. Oh, the dodo once lived, but he doesn't live now. Yet why should a cloud overshadow our brow? The loss of that bird ne'er should trouble our brains, for though he is gone, still our claret remains. Sing do do jolly do do, hurrah! In his name, let our cups overflow. As for your definition, doctor, continued Malik, I'll give you one worth a dozen of yours. Twas a mighty bird whose strong short legs were never known to fail, and he felt a glory of pride while thinking of that little tail, and his beak was marked with vigour, curving like a wondrous hook. Thick and ugly was his body, such a form as made one look. Malek, said Featherstone, you're a volatile youth. You mustn't mind him, doctor. He's a professional cynic, sceptic and scoffer. Oxenden and I, however, are open to conviction and want to know more about these birds and beasts. Can you make anything out of the Opmahira? The doctor swallowed a glass of wine and replied, Oh, yes. There are many birds, each of which may be the Opmahira. There's the fossil bird of Massachusetts, of which nothing is left but the footprints. But some of these are eighteen inches in length, and show a stride of two yards. The bird belonged to the order of the Grelle, and may have been ten or twelve feet in height. Then there is the Gastonis parisiensis, which was as tall as an ostrich, as big as an ox, and belongs to the same order as the other. Then there is the Palapteryx, of which remains have been found in New Zealand, which was seven or eight feet in height. But the one which in my mind is the real counterpart of the Opmahira is a Dinornis gigante, whose remains are also found in New Zealand. It is the largest bird known, with long legs, a long neck and short wings, useless for flight. One specimen that has been found is upward of thirteen feet in height. There is no reason why some should not have been much taller. Moore compares its height to that of a giraffe. The Maoris call this bird the Moa, and their legends and traditions are full of mention of it. When they first came to the island six or seven hundred years ago, they found these vast birds everywhere and hunted them for food. To my mind the Dinornis is the Opmahira of Moore. As to riding on them, that is likely enough. For ostriches are used for this purpose. The Dinornis must have been far stronger and fleeter than the ostrich. It is possible that some of these birds may still be living in the remoter parts of our hemisphere. What about those monsters, asked Featherstone, that Moore speaks of in the sacred hunt? I think, said the doctor, that I understand pretty well what they were, and can identify them all. As the galley passed the estuary of that great river, you remember that he mentions seeing them on the shore. One may have been the Ichthyosaurus. This, as the name implies, is a fish lizard. 
It has the head of a lizard, the snout of a dolphin, the teeth of an alligator, enormous size, whose membrane is strengthened by a bony frame, the vertebrae of fishes, sternum and shoulder bones like those of the lizard, and the fins of a whale. Bayer calls it the whale of the Saurians. Another may have been the Chirotherium. On account of the hand-shaped marks made by its paws, Owen thinks that it was akin to the frogs, but it was a formidable monster with head and jaws of a crocodile. Another may have been the Teleosaurus, which resembled our alligators. It was thirty-five feet in length. Then there was the Hyliosaurus, a monster twenty-five feet in length, with a cuirass of bony plates. But none of these correspond with Moore's description of the monster that fought with the galley. No, said the doctor. I am coming to that now. That monster could have been no other than the Plesiosaurus, one of the most wonderful animals that has ever existed. Imagine a thing with the head of a lizard, the teeth of a crocodile, the neck of a swan, the trunk and tail of a quadruped, and the fins of a whale. Imagine a whale with its head and neck consisting of a serpent, with the strength of the former and the malignant fury of the latter, and then you will have the Plesiosaurus. It was an aquatic animal, yet it had to remain near or on the surface of the water, while its long serpent-like neck enabled it to reach its prey above or below with swift far-reaching darts. Yet it had no armour, and could not have been at all a match for the Ichthyosaurus. Moore's account shows, however, that it was a fearful enemy for man to encounter. He seems to have been less formidable than that beast which they encountered in the swamp. Have you any idea what that was? I think it can have been no other than the Iguanodon, said the doctor. The remains of this animal show that it must have been the most gigantic of all primeval saurians. Judging from existing remains, its length was not less than sixty feet, and larger ones may have existed. It stood high on its legs, the hind ones were larger than the fore. The feet were massive, and armed with tremendous claws. It lived on the land, and fed on herbage. It had a horny, spiky ridge all along its back. Its tail was nearly as long as its body. Its head was short, its jaws enormous furnished with teeth of a very elaborate structure, and on its muzzle it carried a curved horn. Such a beast as this might well have caused all that destruction of life on the part of the desperate assailants of which Moore speaks. Then there was another animal, continued the doctor, who was evidently discoursing upon a favourite topic. It was the one that came suddenly upon Moore while he was resting with Alma, after his flight with the runaway bird. That I take to be the Megalosaurus. This animal was a monster of tremendous size and strength. Cuvier thought that it might have been seventy feet in length. It was carnivorous, and therefore more ferocious than the Iguanodon, and more ready to attack. Its head was like that of a crocodile, its body massive like that of an elephant, yet larger. Its tail was small, and it stood high on its legs, so that it could run with great speed. It was not covered with bony armour, but had probably a hide thick enough to serve the purpose of shell or bone. Its teeth were constructed so as to cut with their edges, and the movement of the jaws produced the combined effect of knife and saw, or the inward curve rendered impossible the escape of prey that had once been caught. It probably frequented the river banks, where it fed upon reptiles of smaller size which inhabited the same places. More, continued the doctor, is too general in his descriptions. He has not a scientific mind, and he gives but few data. Yet I can bring before myself very easily all the scenes which he describes, particularly that one in which the Megalosaurus approaches, and he rushes to mount the Dionornist so as to escape. I see that river with its trees and shrubs, all unknown now except in museums, the vegetation of the coal period the Lepidodendron, the Lepidostrobus, the Picopterus, the Neuropterus, the Longcopterus, the Odontopterus, the Sphenopterus, the Cyclopterus, the Cygularia veniformis, the Sphenophyllium, 
the Calamites. Melek started to his feet. There, there, he cried. Hold hard, doctor. Talking of calamities, what greater calamity can there be than such a torrent of unknown words? Talk English, doctor, and we shall be able to appreciate you. But to make your jokes, your conundrums, and your brilliant witticisms in a foreign language isn't fair to us, and does no credit either to your head or your heart. The doctor elevated his eyebrows and took no notice of Melick's ill-timed levity. All these stories of strange animals, said Oxenden, may be very interesting, doctor, but I must say that I am far more struck by the account of the people themselves. I wonder whether they are an aboriginal race or descendants of the same stock from which we came. I should say, remarked the doctor confidently, that they are beyond a doubt an aboriginal and autochthonous race. I differ from you altogether, said Oxenden calmly. Oh, said the doctor, there can be no doubt about it. Their complexion, small stature, and peculiar eyes, their love of darkness, their singular characteristics, both physical and moral, all go to show that they can have no connection with the races in our part of the earth. Their peculiar eyes, said Oxenden, are no doubt produced by dwelling in caves for many generations. On the contrary, said the doctor, it is their peculiarity of eye that makes them dwell in caves. You are mistaking the cause for the effect, doctor. Not at all. It is you who are making that mistake. It's the old debate, said Malek, as the poet has it. Which was first, the egg or the hen? Tell me, I pray, ye learned men. There are the eyeless fishes of the great cave of Kentucky, said Oxenden, whose eyes have become extinct from living in the dark. No, cried the doctor. The fish that have arisen in that lake have never needed eyes, and have never had them. Oxenden laughed. Well, said he, I'll discuss the question with you on different grounds altogether, and I will show clearly that these men, these bearded men, must belong to a stock that is nearly related to our own, or at least that they belong to a race of men with whom we are all very familiar. I should like very much to have you try it, said the doctor. Very well, said Oxenden. In the first place, I take their language. Their language? Yes. Moore has given us very many words in their language. Now he himself says that these words had an Arabic sound. He was slightly acquainted with that language. What will you say if I tell you that these words are still more like Hebrew? Hebrew! exclaimed the doctor in amazement. Yes, Hebrew, said Oxenden. They are all very much like Hebrew words and the difference is not greater than that which exists between the words of any two languages of the Aryan family. Oh, if you come to philology, I'll throw up the sponge, said the doctor, yet I should like to hear what you have to say on that point. The languages of the Aryan family, said Oxenden, have the same general characteristics, and in all of them the differences that exist in their most common words are subject to the action of a regular law. The action of the law is best seen in the changes which take place in the mutes. These changes are indicated in a summary and comprehensive way by means of what is called Grimm's Law. Take Latin and English, for instance. Grimm's Law tells us, among other things, that in Latin and in that part of English which is of Teutonic origin, a large number of words are essentially the same and differ merely in certain phonetic changes. Take the word father. In Latin, as also in Greek, it is pater. Now the Latin P in English becomes F. That is, the thin mute becomes the aspirated mute. The same change may be seen in the Latin piscis, which in English is fish, and the Greek pour, which in English is fire. Again, if the Latin or Greek word begins with an aspirate, the English word begins with a medial. Thus the Latin F is found responsive to the English B, as in Latin Fagus, English Beech, Latin Ferro, English Bear. Again, if the Latin or Greek has the medial, the English has the thin, as in Latin Duo, English Two, Latin Genu, English Knee. Now I find that in many of the words which Moore mentions, this same Grimm's law will apply, 
and I am inclined to think that if they were spelled with perfect accuracy, they would show the same relation between the Kosekin language and the Hebrew that there is between the Saxon English and the Latin. The doctor gave a heavy sigh. You're out of my depth, Oxenden, said he. I'm nothing of a philologist. By Jove, said Featherstone, I like this. This is equal to your list of the plants of the coal period, doctor. But I say, Oxenden, while you're about it, why don't you give us a little dose of Anglo-Saxon and Sanskrit? By Jove, the fellow has popped by heart, and yet he expects us to argue with him. I have it, cried Melick. The Kosekin are of the lost ten tribes. Oxenden is feeling his way to that. He is going to make them out to be all Hebrew, and then, of course, the only conclusion will be that they are the ten tribes, who, after a life of strange vicissitudes, have pulled up at the South Pole. It's a wonder Moore didn't think of that, or the writer of this yarn, whoever he may be. Well, for my part, I always took a deep interest in the lost ten tribes, and thought them a fine body of men. Don't think they've got much of the Jew about them, said Featherstone languidly. They hate riches and all that, you know. Break a Jew's heart to hear of all that property wasted, and money going a-begging. Not a bad idea, though, that of theirs about money. Too much money is a horrid bore, by Jove. Well, continued Oxenden, calmly resuming and taking no notice of these interruptions, I can give you word after word that Moore has mentioned which corresponds to a kindred Hebrew word in accordance with Grimm's law. For instance, Kasekin op, Hebrew of, Kasekin athon, Hebrew adon, Kasekin salon, Hebrew shalom. They are more like Hebrew than Arabic, just as Anglo-Saxon words are more like Latin or Greek than Sanskrit. Hurrah, cried Malik, we've got him to Sanskrit at last. Now, Oxenden, my boy, trot out the Hitopadesa, the Megaduta, the Rigveda, quote Beowulf and Cadmon, give us a little Zeno, and wind up with Lullawuk in modern Persian. So I conclude said Oxenden, calmly ignoring Malik, that the Kosekin are a Semitic people. Their complexion and their beards show them to be akin to the Caucasian race, and their language proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that they belong to the Semitic branch of that race. It is impossible for an autochthonous people to have such a language. But how, cried the doctor, how in the name of wonder did they get to the South Pole? Easily enough, interrupted Malek. Shem landed there from Noah's Ark and left some of his children to colonise the country. That's as plain as a pike staff. I think on the whole that this idea is better than the other one about the ten tribes. At any rate, they are both mine, and I warn all present to keep their hands off them, for on my return I intend to take out a copyright. There's another thing, continued Oxenden, which is of immense importance, and that is their habit of cave-dwelling. I am inclined to think that they resorted to cave-dwelling at first from some hereditary instinct or other, and that their eyes and their whole moles have become affected by this mode of life. Now as to ornamented caverns, we have many examples. Caverns adorned with a splendour fully equal to anything among the Kosekin. There are in India the great Bahar Caves, and the splendid Kali Temple, with its magnificent sculptures and imposing architecture, and the cavern temples of Alephanta. There are the subterranean works in Egypt, the Temple of Dendera in particular. In Petra we have the case of an entire city excavated from the rocky mountains. Yet after all these do not bear upon the point in question for there are isolated cases, and even Petra, though it contained a city, did not contain a nation. But there is a case, and one which is well known, that bears directly upon this question, and gives us the connecting link between the Kosekin and their Semitic brethren in the Northern Hemisphere. What is that? asked the doctor. The troglodytes, said Oxenden, with impressive solemnity. Well, on what do you make out of the troglodytes? I will explain, said Oxenden. 
The name troglodytes is given to various tribes of men, but those best known and celebrated under this name once inhabited the shores of the Red Sea, both on the Arabian and the Egyptian side. They belonged to the Arabian race and were consequently a Semitic people. Mark that, for it is a point of the utmost importance. Now these troglodytes all lived in caverns, which were formed partly by art and partly by nature, although art must have had most to do with the construction of such vast subterranean works. They lived in great communities in caverns, and they had long tunnels passing from one community to another. Here also they kept their cattle. Some of these people have survived even to our own age, for Bruce the Abyssinian traveller saw them in Nubia. The earliest writer who mentions the troglodytes was Agathocides of Nidos. According to him they were chiefly herdsmen. Their food was the flesh of cattle, and their drink a mixture of milk and blood. They dressed in the skins of cattle, they tattooed their bodies. They were very swift of foot, and were able to run down wild beasts in the hunt. They were also greatly given to robbery, and caravans passing to and fro had to guard against them. One feature in their character has to my mind a strange significance, and that is their feelings with regard to death. It was not the Kosekin love of death, yet it was something which must certainly be considered as approximating to it. For Agathocides says that in their burials they were accustomed to fasten the corpse to a stake, and then gathering round, to pelt it with stones amid shouts of laughter and wild merriment. They also used to strangle the old and infirm, so as to deliver them from the evils of life. These troglodytes, then, were a nation of cave-dwellers, loving the dark, not exactly loving death, yet at any rate regarding it with merriment and pleasure and so I cannot help seeing a connection between them and the Kosekin. Yes, said the doctor, but how did they get to the South Pole? That, said Oxenden, is a question which I do not feel bound to answer. Oh, it is easy enough to answer that, said Malik. They have, of course, dug through the earth. Oxenden gave a groan. I think I'll turn in for the night, said he, rising. Upon this the others rose also and followed his example. On the following morning the calm still continued. None of the party rose until very late, and then over the breakfast table they discussed the manuscript once more, each from his own point of view. Malik still asserting a contemptuous scepticism, Oxenden and the doctor giving reasons for their faith, and Featherstone listening without saying much on either side. At length it was proposed to resume the reading of the manuscript, which task would now devolve upon Oxenden. They adjourned to the deck, where all disposed themselves in easy attitudes, to listen to the continuation of Moore's narrative. End of chapter 17《18 of A Strange Manuscript Found in a Copper Cylinder》this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eddie Winter. A Strange Manuscript Found in a Copper Cylinder by James DeMille. Chapter 18 A Voyage Over the Pole. The discovery of our love had brought a crisis in our fate for me and Alma. The Cohen held it with joy, for now was the time when he would be able to present us to the Cohen Gadol. Our doom was certain and inevitable. We were to be taken to the Emir. We were to be kept until the end of the dark season, and then we were both to be publicly sacrificed. After this our bodies were to be set apart, for the hideous rites of the Mr. Kozak. Such was the fate that lay before us. The Cohen was now anxious to take us to the Emir. I might possibly have persuaded him to postpone our departure, but I saw no use in that. It seemed better to go, for it was possible that, amid new scenes and among new people, 
there might be hope. This too seemed probable to Alma, who was quite anxious to go. The Cohen pressed forward the preparations, and at length a galley was ready for us. The galley was about three hundred feet in length and fifty in width, but not more than six feet in depth. It was like a long raft. The rowers, two hundred in number, sat on a level with the water, one hundred on each side. The oars were small, being not more than twelve feet in length, but made of a very light, tough material with very broad blades. The galley was steered with broad-bladed paddles at both ends. There was no mast or sail. A stern was a light poop, surrounded by a pavilion, and forward there was another. At the bow there was a projecting platform used chiefly in fighting the thanin, or sea monsters, and also in war. There were no masts, flags, or gay streamers, no brilliant colours. All was intensely black, and the ornaments were of the same hue. We were now treated with greater reverence than ever, for we were looked upon as the recipients of the highest honour that could fall on any of the Kosekin, namely the envied dignity of a public death. As we embarked, the whole city lined the public ways, and watched us from the quays, from boats, and from other galleys. Songs were sung by a chosen choir of paupers, and to the sound of this plaintive strain we moved out to sea. "'This will be a great journey for me,' said the Cohen, as we left the port. "'I hope to be made a pauper, at least, and perhaps gain the honour of a public death. I have known people who have gained death for less. There was an Athon last year, who attacked a paymat with forty men and one hundred and twenty rowers. All were killed or drowned, except himself. In reward for this, he gained the Mudasheb, or death recompense. In addition to this, he was set apart for the Mr. Kozak. Then, with you, when a man procures the death of others, he is honoured. Why, yes. How could it be otherwise? said the Cohen. Is it not the same with you? Have you not told me incredible things about your people, among which there were a few that seemed natural and intelligible? Among these was your system of honouring above all men those who procure the death of the largest number. You, with your pretended fear of death, wish to meet it in battle as eagerly as we do, and your most renowned men are those who have sent most to death. To this strange remark I had no answer to make. The air out at sea now grew chillier. The Cohen noticed it also, and offered me his cloak, which I refused. He seemed surprised and smiled. You are growing like one of us, said he. You will soon learn that the greatest happiness in life is to do good to others and sacrifice yourself. You already show this in part. When you are with Alma, you act like one of the Kasekin. You watch her to see and anticipate her slightest wish. You are eager to give her everything. She, on the other hand, is equally eager to give up all to you. Each one of you is willing to lay down life for the other. You would gladly rush upon death to save her from harm, much as you pretend to fear death. And so I see that with Alma you will soon learn how sweet a thing death may be. To live without her, said I, would be so bitter that death with her would indeed be sweet. If I could save her life by laying down my own, death would be sweeter still. And not one of you Kosekin would meet it so gladly. The Kosekin smiled joyously. O oh, almighty and wondrous power of love, he exclaimed, how thou hast transformed this foreigner. O oh, Atamor, you will soon be one of us altogether. For see how it is now? You pretend to love riches and life, and yet you are ready to give up everything for Alma. Gladly. Gladly, I exclaimed. Yes, he said, all that you have, you would gladly lavish on her, and would rejoice to make yourself a pauper for her sweet sake. You would also rejoice equally to give up life for her. Is it not so? It is, said I. 
then I see by this that Alma has awakened within you your true human nature. Thus far it has lain dormant. It has been concealed under a thousand false and unnatural habits, arising from your strange native customs. You have been brought up under some frightful system, where nature is violated. Here among us your true humanity is unfolded, and with Alma you are like the Kasekin. Soon you will learn new lessons, and will find out that there is a new and a final self-abnegation in perfect love, and your love will never rest till you have separated yourself from Alma, so that love can have its perfect work. The sea now opened wide before us, rising up high as if halfway to the zenith, giving the impression of a vast ascent to endless distances. Around, the shores spread themselves, with the shadowy outlines of the mountains, above was the sky all clear, with faint aurora flashes and gleaming stars. Hand in hand with Alma, I stood and pointed out the constellations, as we marked them, while she told me of the different divisions known among the Kasekin, as well as her own people. There, high in the zenith, was the southern polar star, not exactly at the pole, nor yet of very great brightness, but still sufficiently noticeable. Looking back, we saw low down parts of the phoenix and the crane, higher up the toucan, hydrus and pavo. On our right, low down, was the beautiful altar, high up the triangle, while on the left were the swordfish and the flying fish. Turning to look forward, we beheld a more splendid display. Then over the bow of the vessel between the centaur which lay low and Musca Indica, which rose high, there blazed the bright stars of the Southern Cross, a constellation, if not the brightest, at least the most conspicuous and attractive in all the heavens. All around there burned other stars, separated widely. Then over the stern gleamed the splendid luster of Achenar, on the left the brilliant glow of Alpha Robo and Canopus, and low down before us the bright light of Argo. It was a scene full of splendour and fascination. After a time a change came over the sky. The aurora flashes, at first faint, gradually increased in brilliancy, till the stars grew dim, and all the sky, wherever the eye might turn from the horizon to the zenith, seemed filled with lustrous flames of every conceivable hue. Colossal beams radiated from the pole towards the horizon, till the central light was dissipated, and there remained encircling us an infinite colonnade of flaming pillars that towered to the stars. These were all in motion, running upon one another, incessantly shifting and changing. New scenes forever succeeded to old. Pillars were transformed to pyramids, pyramids to fiery bars. These in their turn were transformed to other shapes. And all the while one tint of innumerable hues overspread the entire circle of sky. Our voyage occupied several joms, but our progress was continuous, for different sets of rowers relieved one another at regular intervals. On the second jom, a storm broke out. The sky had been gathering clouds during sleeping time, and when we awoke we found the sea all lashed to fury, while all around the darkness was intense. The storm grew steadily worse, the lightning flashed, the thunder pealed, and at length the sea was so heavy that rowing was impossible. Upon this the oars were all taken in, and the galley lay tossing upon the furious sea, amid waves that continually beat upon her. And now a scene ensued that filled me with amazement, and took away all my thoughts from the storm. It seemed impossible that so frail a bark could stand the fury of the waves. Destruction was inevitable, and I was expecting to see the usual signs of grief and despair, wondering too how these rowers would preserve their subordination. But I had forgotten in my excitement the strange nature of the Kasekin. Instead of terror there was joy, instead of wild despair there was peace and serene delight. The lightning flashes revealed a wonderful scene. There were all the rowers, each one upon his seat, 
and from them all there came forth a chant which was full of triumph like a song of public welcome to some great national hero or a song of joy over victory the officers embraced one another and exchanged words of delight the cohen after embracing all the others turned to me and forgetting my foreign ways exclaimed in a tone of enthusiastic delight we are destroyed death is near rejoice accustomed as i was to the perils of the sea i had learned to face death without flinging alma too was calm for to her this death seemed preferable to that darker fate which awaited us but the words of the cohen jarred upon my feelings "'Do you not intend to do anything to save the ship?' I asked. "'He laughed joyously. "'There's no occasion,' said he. "'When the oars are taken in, we always begin to rejoice. "'And why not? "'Death is near. "'It is almost certain. "'Why should we do anything to distract our minds and mar our joy? "'For, oh, dear friend, the glorious time has come "'when we can give up life, life with all its toils, "'its burdens, its endless bitternesses, its perpetual evils.' Now we shall have no more suffering from vexatious and oppressive riches, from troublesome honours, from a surplus of food, from luxuries and delicacies, and all the ills of life. But what is the use of being born at all? I asked, in a wonder that never ceased to rise at every fresh display of Kosekin feeling. The use, said the Cohen. Why, if we were not born, how could we know the bliss of dying, or enjoy the sweetness of death? Death is the end of being, the one sweet hope and crown and glory of life, the one desire and hope of every living man. The blessing is denied to none. Rejoice with me, O Atamor. You will soon know its blessedness as well as I. He turned away. I held Alma in my arms, and we watched the storm by the lightning flashes and waited for the end. But the end came not. The galley was light, broad, and buoyant as a lifeboat. At the same time, it was so strongly constructed that there was scarcely any twist or contortion in the sinewy fabric. So we floated buoyantly and safely upon the summit of vast waves, and a storm that would have destroyed a ship of the European fashion scarcely injured this in the slightest degree. It was as indestructible as a raft, and as buoyant as a bubble. So we rode out the gower, and the death which the Kosekin invoked did not come at all. The storm was but short-lived. The clouds dispersed, and soon went scudding over the sky. The sea went down. The rowers had to take their oars once more, and the reaction that followed upon their recent rejoicing was visible in universal gloom and dejection. As the clouds dispersed, the aurora lights came out more splendid than ever and showed nothing but melancholy faces. The rowers pulled with no life or animation. The officers stood about sighing and lamenting. Alma and I were the only ones that rejoiced over this escape from death. Drums passed. We saw other sights. We met with galleys and saw many ships about the sea. Some were moved by sails only. These were merchant ships, but they had only square sails, and could not sail in any other way than before the wind. Once or twice I caught glimpses of vast shadowy objects in the air. I was startled and terrified, for great as were the wonders of this strange region, I had not yet suspected that the air itself might have denizens as tremendous as the land or the sea. Yet it was so, and afterward, during the voyage, I saw them often. One in particular was so near, that I observed it with ease. It came flying along in the same course with us, at a height of about fifty feet from the water. It was a frightful monster with a long body and vast wings, like those of a bat. Its progress was swift, and it soon passed out of sight. To Alma the monster created no surprise. She was familiar with them, and told me that they were very abundant here, but that they were never known to attack ships. She informed me that they were capable of being tamed if caught when young, though in her country they were never made use of. The name given by the Kosekin to these monsters is Athaleb. At length we grew near to our destination. 
we reached a large harbour at the end of a vast bay. Here the mountains extended around, and before us there arose terrace after terrace of twinkling lights, running away to immense distances. It looked like a city of a million inhabitants, though it may have contained far less than that. By the brilliant aurora light, I could see that it was in general shape and form precisely like the city that we had left, though far larger and more populous. The harbour was full of ships and boats of all sorts, some lying at the stone quays, others leaving port, others entering. Galleys passed and repassed, and merchant ships with their clumsy sails and small fishing boats. From afar arose the deep hum of a vast multitude, and the low roar that always ascends from a popular city. The galley hauled alongside her wolf, and we found ourselves at length in the mighty emir of the Kasekin. The Cohen alone landed, the rest remained on board, and Alma and I with them. Other galleys were here. On the wharf workmen were moving about. Just beyond were caverns that looked like warehouses. Above these was a terraced street, where a vast multitude moved to and fro, a living tide as crowded and as busy as that in Cheapside. After what seemed a long time the Cohen returned. This time he came with a number of people, all of whom were in cars drawn by opcooks. Half were men and half women. These came aboard, and it seemed as though we were to be separated, for the women took Alma while the men took me. Upon this I entreated the Cohen not to separate us. I informed him that we were both of a different race from his, that we did not understand their ways. We should be miserable if separated. I spoke long and with all the entreaty possible, to one with my limited acquaintance with the language. My words evidently impressed them. Some of them even wept. You make us sad, said the Cohen. Willingly would we do everything that you bid, for we are your slaves. But the state law prevents. Still in your case the law will be modified, for you are in such honour here that you may be considered as beyond the laws. For the present at least we cannot separate you. These words brought much consolation. After this we landed, and Alma and I were still together. End of chapter 18、to、nineteen of a strange manuscript found in a copper cylinder. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eddie Winter. A strange manuscript found in a copper cylinder by James de Mille. Chapter nineteen: The Wonders of the Emir. We were drawn on cars up to the first terraced street, and here we found the vast multitude, which we had seen from a distance. Crossing this street, we ascended and came to another precisely like it. Then, still going on, we came to a third. Here there was an immense space, not overgrown with trees like the streets, but perfectly open. In the midst arose a lofty pyramid, and as I looked at it, I could not refrain from shuddering, for it looked like the public altar upon which, in due time, I should be compelled to make my appearance. And be offered up as a victim to the terrific superstitions of the Kasekin. Crossing this great square, we came to a vast portal, which opened into a cavern with twinkling lights. The city itself extended above this, for we could see the terraced streets rising above our heads. But here our progress ended at the great cavern in the chief square opposite the pyramid. On entering the cavern, we traversed an antechamber. And then, passing on, we reached a vast dome of dimensions so great that I could perceive no end in that gloom. The twinkling light served only to disclose the darkness, and to indicate the immensity of the cavern. In the midst, there arose two enormous columns, which were lost in the gloom above. It was only by passing through this that we learned its great extent. 
we at length came to the other end, and here we saw numerous passages leading away. The Cohen led us through one of these, and after passing through several other domes of smaller dimensions, we at length reached an apartment where we stopped. This place was furnished with couches and hangings, and lighted with flaming lamps. The light was distressing to those who had accompanied us, and many of them left while the few who remained had to cover their eyes. Here we found that all preparations had been made. The apartments were all illuminated, though our love of light never ceased to be a matter of amazement to the Kosekin, and a bounteous repast was spread for us. But the Cohen and the others found the light intolerable, and soon left us to ourselves. After the repast, some women appeared to take Alma to her chamber, and with the usual kindness of the Kosekin, they assured her that she would not be expected to obey the law of separation, but that she was to remain here, where she would be always within reach of me. After her departure, they came to visit me the lowest man in all the land of the Kosekin, though according to our view he would be esteemed the highest. This was the Cohen Godol. His history had already been told me. I had learned that through lack of Kosekin virtue he had gradually sunk to this position, and now was compelled to hold in his hands more wealth, power, and display than any other man in the nation. He was a man of singular appearance. The light was not so troublesome to him as to the others. He merely kept his eyes shaded, but he regarded me with a keen look of inquiry that was suggestive of shrewdness and cunning. I confess, it was with a feeling of relief that I made this discovery, for I longed to find someone among this singular people who was selfish, who feared death, who loved life, who loved riches, and had something in common with me. This I thought I perceived in the shrewd, cunning face of the Cohen Godol, and I was glad, for I saw that while he could not possibly be more dangerous to me than those self-sacrificing, self-denying cannibals whom I had thus far known, he might prove of some assistance, and might help me to devise some means of escape. If I could only find someone who was a coward, and selfish, and avaricious, if this Cohen Godol could but be he, how much brighter my life would be. And so there happened to me an incredible thing, that my highest wish was now to find in the Cohen Godol cowardice, avarice, and selfishness. The Cohen was accompanied by a young female, richly attired, who I afterward learned was his daughter. Her name was Layla, and she filled the office of Melka, which signifies queen. And though honourable with us, above all, is among the Kosekin the lowest in the land. Layla was so beautiful that I looked at her in amazement. She was very tall for one of the Kosekin, which made her stature equal to that of an ordinary girl with us. Her hair was rich, dark, and luxuriant. Gathered about her head, in great masses, and bound by a golden band. Her features were delicate and perfect in their outline. Her expression was noble and commanding. Her eyes were utterly unlike those of the other Kosekin. The upper lids had a slight droop, but that was all, and that was the nearest approach to the national blink. Her first entrance into the room seemed to dazzle her, and she shaded her eyes for a few moments. But after that she looked at me fixedly, and seemed to suffer no more inconvenience than I did. The perfect liberty of women among the Kosekin made this visit from her quite as natural as that of her father, and though she said but little on this occasion, she was an attentive listener and close observer. Their visit was long, for they were evidently full of curiosity. They had heard much about me and wished to see more. It was the first time that I had found among the Kosekin the slightest desire to know where I had come from. Hitherto all had been content with the knowledge that I was a foreigner, 
Now, however, I found in the Kohen Gadol and Layla a curiosity that was most eager and intense. They questioned me about my country, about the great world beyond the mountains, about the way in which I had come here, about the manners and customs of my countrymen. They were eager to know about those great nations of which I spoke, who loved light and life, about men who loved themselves better than others, of that world where men feared death and loved life, and sought after riches and lived in the light. The sleeping time came and passed, and my visitors were still full of eager questionings. It was Layla who at last thought of the lateness of the hour. At a word from her the Kohen Gadol rose, with many apologies, and prepared to go, but before he left he said, When I was a child, I was shipwrecked, and was taken up a ship which conveyed me to a nation beyond the sea. There I grew up to manhood. I learned their language and manners and customs, and when I returned home, I found myself an alien here. I do not love darkness or death. I do not hate riches, and the result is that I am what I am. If I were like the rest of my countrymen, my lot would make me miserable. But as it is, I prefer it to any other, and consider myself not the lowest, but the greatest in the land. My daughter is like me, and instead of being ashamed of her station, she is proud of it, and would not give it up even to become a pauper. I will see you again. I have much to say. With these words the Kohen Gadol retired, followed by Layla, leaving me more hopeful than I had been for a long time. For many joms following, I received visits from the Kohen Gadol and from Layla. Alma was with me until sleeping time, and then these other visitors would come. In this at least they resembled the other Kasekin, that they never dreamed of interfering with Alma when she might wish to be with me. The visits were always long, and we had much to say, but what I lost in sleep I always made up on the following John. The Kohen Gadol, with his keen, shrewd face, interested me greatly, but Layla, with her proud face and air of command, was a positive wonder. I soon learned that the Kohen Gadol was what we term a man of advanced views, or perhaps a reformer, or a philosophic radical. It matters not which. Suffice it to say that his ideas and feelings differed from those of his nation, and if carried out would be equal to a revolution in politics and morals. The Kohen Gadol advocated selfishness as a true law of life, without which no state can prosper. There were a few of similar views, but they were all regarded with great contempt by the multitude, and had to suffer the utmost rigour of the law, for they were all endowed with vast wealth, compelled to live in the utmost splendour and luxury, to have enormous retinues, and to wield the chief power in politics and in religion. Even this, however, had not changed the sentiments of the condemned, and I learned that they were labouring incessantly, notwithstanding their severe punishment, to disseminate their peculiar doctrines. These were formulated as follows. 1. A man should not love others better than himself. 2. Life is not an evil to be got rid of. 3. Other things are to be preferred to death. 4. Poverty is not the best state for man. 5. Unrequited love is not the greatest happiness. 6. Lovers may sometimes marry. 7. To serve is not more honourable than to command. 8. Defeat is not more glorious than victory. 9. To save a life should not be regarded as a criminal offence. 10. The paupers should be forced to take a certain amount of wealth to relieve the necessities of the rich. These articles were considered both by the Kohen Gadol and by Layla to be remarkable for their audacity, and were altogether too advanced for mention by any except the chosen few. 
With the multitude he had to deal differently, and had to work his way by concealing his opinions. He had made a great conspiracy in which he was still engaged, and had gained immense numbers of adherents by allowing them to give him their whole wealth. Through his assistance many Athons and Cohens and Meleks had become artisans, labourers, and even paupers, but all were bound by him to the strictest secrecy. If anyone should divulge the secret, it would be ruined to him, and to many others, for they would at once be punished by the bestowal of the extremest wealth, by degradation to the rank of rulers and commanders, and by the severest rigours of luxury, power, splendour, and magnificence known among the Kosekin. Overwhelmed thus with the cares of government, crushed under the weight of authority and autocratic rule, surrounded by countless slaves all ready to die for them, their lives would be embittered, and their punishment would be more than they could bear. But the philosophic Cohen Gadol dared all these punishments, and pursued his way calmly and pertinaciously. Nothing surprised the Cohen Gadol so much as the manner in which I received his confidences. He half expected to startle me by his boldness, but was himself confounded by my words. I told him that in my country self was the chief consideration, self-preservation the law of nature, death the king of terrors, wealth the object of universal search, poverty the worst of evils, unrequited love, nothing less than anguish and despair, to command others the highest glory, victory, honour, defeat, intolerable shame, and other things of the same sort, all of which sounded in his ears, as he said with such tremendous force, that they were like peals of thunder. He shook his head despondently. He could not believe that such views as mine could ever be attained to among the Kosekin. But Layla was bolder, and with all a woman's impetuosity, grasped at my fullest meaning, and held it firm. He is right, said Layla, the heaven-born Atamor. He shall be our teacher. The rich shall be esteemed, the poor shall be downtrodden. To rule over others shall be glorious, to serve shall be base. Victory shall be an honour, defeat a shame. Selfishness, self-seeking luxury and indulgence shall be virtues. Poverty, want and squalor shall be things of abhorrence and contempt. The face of Layla glowed with enthusiasm as she said these words and I saw in her a daring, intrepid, and high-hearted woman, full of a woman's headlong impetuosity and disregard of consequences. In me she saw one who seemed to her like a prophet and teacher of a new order of things, and her whole soul responded to the principles which I announced. It required immense strength of mind and firmness of soul to separate herself from the prevalent sentiment of her nation and though nature had done much for her in giving her a larger portion of original selfishness than was common to her people, still she was a child of the Kosekin, and her daring was all the more remarkable. And so she went further than her father, and adopted my extreme views when he shrank back, and dared more unflinchingly the extremest rigours of the national law, and all that the Kosekin could inflict in the way of wealth luxury, supreme command, palatial abodes, vast retinues of slaves, and the immense degradation of the queenly office. I spoke to her in a warning voice about her rashness. Oh, said she, I have counted the cost, and am ready to accept all that they can inflict. I embrace the good cause, and will not give it up, no, not even if they could increase my wealth a thousandfold and sentence me to live a hundred seasons. I can bear their utmost inflictions of wealth, power, magnificence. I could even bear being condemned to live forever in the light. Oh, my friend, it is the conviction of right and the support of conscience that strengthens one to bear the greatest evils that man can inflict. From these words, it was evident to me that Layla was a true child of the Kosekin, for though she was of advanced sentiments, 
she still used the language of her people, and spoke of the punishments of the law as though they were punishments in reality. Now to me and to Alma, these so-called punishments seemed rewards. It was impossible for me to avoid feeling a very strong regard for this enthusiastic and beautiful girl, all the more, indeed, because she evinced such an undisguised admiration for me. She evidently considered me some superior being, from some superior race, and although my broken and faulty way of speaking the language was something of a trial, still she seemed to consider every word I uttered as a maxim of the highest wisdom, the tritest of truths, the commonest of platitudes, the most familiar of proverbs or old saws current among us were eagerly seized by Layla, and accepted as truths almost divine as new doctrines for the guidance of the human race. These she would discuss with me. She would put them into better and more striking language, and ask for my opinion. Then she would write them down. For the Kosekin knew the art of writing. They had an alphabet of their own, which was at once simple and very scientific. There were no vowels, but only consonant sounds, the vowels being supplied in reading, just as if one should write the words FTHR or DGHTR and read them father and daughter. Their letters were as follows, PKTBG DF CH TH M L N S H R There were also three others which have no equivalents in English. It soon became evident to me that Layla had a complete ascendancy over her father, that she was not only the Malka of the Emir, but the presiding spirit and the chief administrative genius of the whole nation of the Kosekin. She seemed to be the new Semiramis one who might revolutionise an empire and introduce a new order of things. Such indeed was her high ambition, and she plainly avowed it to me. But what was more, she frankly informed me, but that she regarded me as a heaven-sent teacher, as one who in this darkness could tell her of the nations of light, who could instruct her in the wisdom of other and greater races, and help her to accomplish her grand designs. As for Alma, she seemed quite beneath the notice of the aspiring Layla. She never noticed her. She never spoke of her. And she always made her visits to me after Alma had gone. End of chapter 19《of a strange manuscript found in a copper cylinder. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Carroll A Strange Manuscript Found in a Copper Cylinder by James DeMille Chapter 20 The Dark Maiden Layla Layla, at length, began to make pointed remarks about Alma. "'She loves you,' said she, "'and you love her. "'How is it that you do not give each other up?' "'I would die rather than give up Alma,' said I. Layla smiled. "'That sounds strange to the Kosekin,' said she. "'For here, to give up your love and to die "'are both esteemed the greatest possible blessings. "'But Alma should give you up. "'It is the women with us who make the beginning.' Women generally fall in love first, and it is expected that they will tell their love first. The delicacy of a woman's feelings makes this natural. For if a man tells his love to a woman who does not love him, it shocks her modesty, while if a woman tells a man, he has no modesty to shock. That is strange, said I. But suppose the man does not love the woman. Why, no woman wants to be loved. She only wants to love. At this I felt somewhat bewildered. That, said Layla, is unrequited love, which is the chief blessing here, though for my part I am a philosopher, and would wish, when I love, to be loved in return. And then, said I, if so, would you give up your lover, in accordance with the custom of your country? 
Layla's dark eyes rested on me for a moment with a glance of intense earnestness and profound meaning. She drew a long breath, and then said in a low, tremulous voice, Never. Layla was constantly with me, and at length used to come at an earlier time, when Alma was present. Her manner toward Alma was full of the usual Kosekin courtesy and gracious cordiality. She was still intent upon learning from me the manners, customs, and principles of action of the race to which I belonged. She had an insatiable thirst for knowledge, and her curiosity extended to all of those great inventions which are the wonder of Christendom. Locomotives and steamboats were described to her, under the names of horses of fire and ships of fire. Printing was letters of power, the electric telegraph messages of lightning, the organ loot of giants, and so on. Yet, in spite of the eagerness with which she made her inquiries, and the diligence with which she noted all down, I could see that there was in her mind something lying beneath it all, a far more earnest purpose, and a far more personal one, than the pursuit of useful knowledge. Layla was watchful of Alma. She seemed studying her to see how far this woman of another race differed from the Kosekin. She would often turn from me and talk with Alma for a long time, questioning her about her people and their ways. Alma's manner was somewhat reserved, and it was rendered somewhat more so from the fact that her mind was always full of the prospect of our impending doom. Each jump as it came and went brought us nearer to that awful time, and the hour was surely coming when we should be taken to the outer square and to the top of the pyramid of sacrifice. Once Layla sat for some time silent and involved in thought. At length she began to speak to me. Alma, said she, is very different from us. She loves you, and you love her. She ought to give you up. Alma, you ought to give up Atamor, since you love him. Alma looked confused, and made some reply to the effect that she belonged to a different race with different customs. But you should follow our customs. You are one of us now. You can easily find another who will take him. Alma threw a piteous glance at me and said nothing. I, said Layla, will take him. She spoke these words with an air of magnanimity, as though putting it in the light of a favor to Alma. But Alma did not make any reply, and after some silence Layla spoke of something else. Not long after we were alone together and Layla returned to the subject, she referred to Alma's want of sympathy with the manners of the Kosekin, and asserted that she ought to aim after a separation. "'I love her,' said I, with great warmth, "'and will never give her up.' but she must give you up. It is the woman's place to take the first step. I should be willing to take you. As Layla said this, she looked at me very earnestly, as if anxious to see how I accepted this offer. It was for me a most embarrassing moment. I loved Alma, but Layla also was most agreeable, and I liked her very much. Indeed, so much, so that I could not bear to say anything that might hurt her feelings. Among all the Kosekin there was not one who was not infinitely inferior to her in my eyes. Still, I loved Alma, and I told her so again, thinking that in this way I might repel her without giving offense. But Layla was quite ready with her reply. If you love Alma, said she, that is the very reason why you should marry me. This made me feel more embarrassed than ever. I stammered something about my own feelings the manners and customs of my race, and the fear that I had of acting against my own principles. Besides, I added, I'm afraid it would make you unhappy. Oh, no, said Layla, briskly. On the contrary, it would make me very happy indeed. I began to be more and more aghast at this tremendous frankness, and was utterly at a loss what to say. My father, continued Layla, is different from the other Kosekin, and so am I. I seek requital for love, and do not think it an evil. A sudden thought now suggested itself, and I caught at it as a last resort. You have, said I, some lover among the Kosekin. Why do you not marry him? Layla smiled. I have no lover that I love, said she, among the Kosekin. My feeble effort was thus a miserable failure. I was about saying something concerning the Kosekin alphabet, or something else of an equally appropriate nature, when she prevented me. Atamor, said she, in a low voice. 
Layla, said I, with my mind full of confusion, I love you. She sat looking at me with her beautiful face all aglow, her dark eyes fixed on mine with an intense and eager gaze. I looked at her and said not one single word. Layla was the first to break the awkward silence. You love Alma, Atamor, but say, do you not love me? You smile at me. You meet me always when I come, with warm greetings, and you seem to enjoy yourself in my society. Say, Atamor, do you not love me? This was a perilous and tremendous moment. The fact is, I did like Layla very much indeed, and I wanted to tell her so. But my ignorance of the language did not allow me to observe those nice distinctions of meaning which exist between the words like and love. I knew no other word than the one Kosekin word meaning love, and could not think of any meaning like. It was, therefore, a very trying position for me. Dear Layla, said I, floundering and stammering in my confusion, I love you. I... But here I was interrupted without waiting for any further words. The beautiful creature flung her arms around me and clung to me with a fond embrace. As for me, I was utterly confounded, bewildered, and desperate. I thought of my darling Alma, whom alone I loved. It seemed at that moment as though I was not only false to her, but as if I was even endangering her life. My only thought now was to clear up my meaning. Dear Layla, said I, as I sat with her arms around me, and with my own around her slender waist, I do not want to hurt your feelings. Oh, Atamor, oh, my love, never, never did I know such bliss as this. Here again I was overwhelmed, but I still persisted in my effort. Dear Layla, said I, I love Alma most dearly and most tenderly. Oh, Atamor, why speak of that? I know it well. And so, by our Kosekin law, you give her up. Among us, lovers never marry. So you take me, your own Layla, and you will have me for your bride, and my love for you is ten thousand times stronger than that of the cold and melancholy Alma. She may marry my papa. This suggestion filled me with dismay. Oh, no, said I. Never, never will I give up Alma. Certainly not, said Layla. You do not give her up. She gives you up. She never will, said I. Oh, yes, said Layla. I will tell her that you wish it. I do not wish it, said I. I love her and will never give her up. It's all the same, said Layla. You cannot marry her at all. No one will marry you. You and Alma are victims, and the state has given you the matchless honor of death. Common people who love one another may marry if they choose, and take the punishment which the law assigns, but illustrious victims who love cannot marry, and so, my Aunt Amor, you have only me. I need not say that all this was excessively embarrassing. I was certainly fond of Layla, and liked her too much to hurt her feelings. Had I been one of the Kosekin, I might perhaps have managed better. But being a European, a man of the Aryan race, being such, and sitting there with the beautiful Layla lavishing all her affections upon me, why, it stands to reason that I could not have the heart to wound her feelings in any way. I was taken at an utter disadvantage. Never in my life had I heard of women taking the initiative. Layla had proposed to me, she would not listen to refusal, and I had not the heart to wound her. I had made all the fight I could by persisting in asserting my love for Alma, but all my assertions were brushed lightly aside as trivial things. Let any gentleman put himself in my situation and ask himself what he would do. What would he do if such a thing could happen to him at home? But there such a thing could not happen, and so there is no use in supposing an impossible case. At any rate, I think I deserve sympathy. Who could keep his presence of mind under such circumstances? With us, a young lady who loves one man can easily repel another suitor. But here it was very different, for how could I repel Layla? Could I turn upon her and say, unhand me? Could I say, away, I am another's? Of course I couldn't. And what's worse, if I had said such things, Layla would have smiled me down into silence. The fact is, it doesn't do for women to take the initiative. It's not fair. I had stood a good deal among the Kosekin. Their love of darkness, their passion for death, their contempt of riches, their yearning after unrequited love, their human sacrifices, their cannibalism, all had more or less become familiar to me, and I had learned to acquiesce in silence. But now when it came to this, that a woman should propose to a man, 
it really was more than a fellow could stand. I felt this at that moment very forcibly. But then the worst of it was that Layla was so confoundedly pretty, and had such a nice way with her that hang me if I knew what to say. Meanwhile, Layla was not silent. She had all her wits about her. Dear Papa, said she, would make such a nice husband for Alma. He is a widower, you know. I could easily persuade him to marry her. He always does whatever I ask him to do. But victims cannot marry, you said. No, said Layla, sweetly. They cannot marry one another. But Alma may marry dear Papa, and then you and I can be married, and it will all be very nice indeed. At this I started away. No, said I, indignantly. It won't be nice. I'm engaged to be married to Alma, and I'm not going to give her up. Oh, but she gives you up, you know, said Layla, quietly. Well, but I'm not going to be given up. Why, how unreasonable you are, you foolish boy, said Layla in her most caressing manner. You have nothing at all to do with it. At this I was in fresh despair, and then a new thought came, which I seized upon. See here, said I, why can't I marry both of you? I'm engaged to Alma, and I love her better than all the world. Let me marry her and you too. At this Layla laughed long and merrily. Peal after peal of laughter, musical and most merry, burst from her. It was contagious. I could not help joining in, and so we both sat laughing. It was a long time before we regained our self-control. Why, that's downright bigamy, exclaimed Layla with fresh laughter. Why, Atomore, you're mad! And so she went off again in fresh peals of laughter. It was evident that my proposal was not at all shocking, but simply comical, ridiculous, and inconceivable in its absurdity. It was to her what the remark of some despairing beauty who would be among us, who, when pressed by two lovers, should express a confused willingness to marry both. It was evident that Layla accepted it as a ludicrous jest. Laughter was all very well, of course, but I was serious, and felt that I ought not to part with Layla without some better understanding, and so I once more made an effort. All this, said I, in a mournful tone, is a mere mockery. What have I to say about love and marriage? If you loved me, as you say, you would not laugh, but weep. You forget what I am. What am I? A victim, and doomed, doomed to a hideous fate, a fate of horror unutterable. You cannot even begin to imagine the anguish with which I look forward to that fate which impends over me and Alma. Marriage, idle word. What have I to do with marriage? What has Alma? There is only one marriage before us, the dread marriage with death. Why talk of love to the dying? The tremendous ordeal, the sacrifice, is before us, and after that there remains the hideous Mr. Kosek. At this Layla sprang up, with her whole face and attitude full of life and energy. I know, I know, said she, quickly. I have arranged for all. Your life shall be saved. Do you think that I have consented to your death? Never. You are mine. I will save you. I will show you what we can do. You shall escape. Can you really save me? I cried. I can. What, in spite of the whole nation? Layla laughed scornfully. I can save you, said she. We can fly. There are other nations besides ours. We can find some land among the Gojin where we can live in peace. The Gojin are not like us. But Alma, said I. The face of Layla clouded. I can only save you, said she. Then I will stay and die with Alma, said I, obstinately. What? said Layla. Do you not fear death? Of course I do, said I, but I'd rather die than lose Alma. But it's impossible to save both of you. Then leave me and save Alma, said I. What? Would you give up your life for Alma? Yes, and a thousand lives, said I. Why, said Layla, now you talk just like the Kosekin. You might as well be one of us. You love death for the sake of Alma. Why not be more like the Kosekin and seek after a separation from Alma? Layla was not at all offended at my declaration of love for Alma. She uttered these words in a lively tone, and then said that it was time for her to go. End of chapter 20